Good afternoon and welcome to the fall 2021 town hall. Please note that everybody is muted today. However, the chat is open, so please feel free to interact and submit any comments and questions in the chat. Please make sure that your comments and questions are appropriate and respectful during the session. Uh, questions that are submitted to the Q&A will be addressed at the end of the town hall. Uh, and with that said, I'll, I'll turn it over to Ali. Well, good afternoon and welcome everyone. Welcome to our students, faculty, staff. Okay, and there goes my screen. Sorry. Staff and trustees who are joining us today. We begin today by acknowledging that the land we gather on is the traditional unceded territory of the Council of the Three Fires, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and Potawatomi nations. We honor with gratitude this land and the indigenous people who have stewarded it throughout the generations. I'm very happy to see all of you and have everyone on campus this academic year. And while I embrace the possibilities of remote learning, I also recognize the importance of in-person learning to forge relationships with our students and our faculty and staff. COVID, unfortunately, is still here. Roosevelt continues to be committed to providing a safe and healthy environment on campus by remaining cautious, adhering to mitigation efforts, following CDC guidelines, requiring vaccines for all students, faculty, and staff, enforcing mask mandates when indoors, and any other actions needed to decrease our rate of transmission. That is why we will be having forums such as today's town hall virtually. We know there are still many challenges ahead of us before returning to normalcy. So we're taking proactive measures to keep our community safe whenever we have the opportunity. So there's a lot to talk to you about today, including five major items. One, information from leadership around university operations. Two, Dean Melissa Hogan will provide the latest information regarding COVID and Roosevelt's mitigation efforts. Three, an academic update and important work being done by our students and faculty. Four, the 2021 American Dream Reconsidered Conference. And then finally, update on the auditorium theater. We will have plenty of time at the end for your questions and hopefully our answers. So update from leadership. First and foremost, the Roosevelt University Board of Trustees has approved a new strategic plan, which was developed with input from steering committee members and feedback from the executive council Dean's Council, Senate Executive Committee, University Senate, Administrative Assembly, faculty, students, and college advisory councils. The inclusive process opened a dialogue about ways to take advantage of opportunities and mitigate challenges in the current higher education environment. The strategic plan concentrates on four umbrella goals university optimization, student development, university distinction, and financial stabilization. Going forward, the steering committee will monitor yearly goals and outcomes to adjust for continuous improvement and ensure a forward momentum. A special thank you to our colleague, Maybelline Kruger for her work as chair of the steering committee, and to all the members of the steering committee for their time and service. The strategic plan and a full listing of the steering committee members can be found on our website. Now I'm very optimistic about the future of the university. At the same time, I remain cautious, especially in the unpredictable environment we're in because of many factors, including the pandemic. 
I'm very pleased to say that with the application of the remaining COVID relief funds, the university is expected to have a balanced budget this academic year. This achievement is a direct result of the sacrifices you all made, your hard work, your support, and your ongoing achievements. Thank you for that. Well, everyone has been very responsive in terms of budgeting and creating increased efficiencies with positive and productive outcomes on every level from administrative to academic program. We will be announcing shortly a fiscal 23 tuition increase. It will be a 5% increase for undergraduates and 7% increase for graduate students. As you know, we did not increase tuition last year and had very modest increases the previous years. But tuition increase is necessary in order, in order to stay competitive, sustain the university for the future, and be consistent with the overall economy. Now, I remind you often that Roosevelt assesses programs and facilities on an ongoing basis in order to reduce debt, increase enrollment, find new revenue streams, and invest in order to provide more opportunities for our students. I would also like to discuss our decision to close the Peoria location. This was a difficult one, but enrollment clearly supported our decision not to renew the lease for the existing space when it expires at the end of this year. As one of our lessons learned during COVID, we have become much more comfortable and successful at delivering course content and assuring positive students' outcomes in a remote format. Roosevelt will continue to recruit in this geographic region for our online programs. And we are currently exploring offering degree completion programs and teacher certification via face-to-face -face instruction at community colleges and other, or other locations in the central region. And we're always seeking new ways to expand geographically if it will support our strategic plan. For example, the new post bac certificate in healthcare ethics and analytics, which will be offered in an online format beginning in the spring of 22. Now in student affairs and housing, I wanna inform you that the Division of Student Affairs has restructured to better support student life, wellness, and access on campus. We have merged the Center for Student Involvement and Multicultural Student Services in the new Office of Engagement, Equity, and Inclusion. The new office will support all initiatives of the former offices, such as student clubs, SGA, and cultural organizations and programming with a greater emphasis on social justice. This semester, we will also see construction for the new home of the Office of Engagement, Equity, and Inclusion. The student union in the Wabash building will include a gaming room, a lounge, and places for students to relax and study together. Students can also find veteran services, the food and toiletry pantry, and other services all in one location. Another source of belonging on campus is Roosevelt's residential communities, which will return in the spring semester. After a brief hiatus in the pandemic, our residential communities will again welcome groups of students with similar interests into living communities in the Wabash building. I also have some great news to report as it relates to fall residential housing. As of September 30th, we have surpassed our fall budgeted goal by 132 beds, which is a revenue increase of $652,000 over original projections. 
The Wabash building and the UCC are both near housing capacity. So thank you so much to Vice President Jamar Orr and his team for developing a comprehensive plan that clearly articulated the value of living on campus to the students. The results speak for themselves. Now in our first year, uh, our first year and transfer success courses, new students are discussing Take the Mic as the common read. The book explores ways to persist in everyday life. We look forward to hearing from editor and author Bethany Morrow at the American Dream Reconsidered Conference the first week of November. On fundraising and alumni relations, it is not just me that is optimistic about our future, but our donors and supporters are too. With overall fundraising efforts up 5.2% from last year, the university appreciates every dollar it receives because it helps fund scholarships, student services, and infrastructure. In some cases, if it weren't for this generous support, students would not have opportunities to attend Roosevelt University. Now, this is all the results of very effective work by Jared Fritz McCarthy, Keely Johnson, and Dustin Price, who worked very hard in sharing our story, your story, and achievements with the current students and the new donors. We recently celebrated the significant contribution, uh, of, contribution of our alumni uh, to our communities and the 2021 Distinguished Alumni Award Ceremony that was held on Friday, October 1st. We recognize alumni for not only their successful professional careers, but their passion for creating meaningful change in our society. Thank you to interim provost, Maybelline Kruger, Dean Cammie McBride, co-dean Kelly Wentz-Hunter, Dean Brian Petty, Dean Rudy Marcosi, and Dean Tom Fillion for participating in this event. And to Jessica Mueller and Christy Kotak in alumni relations for organizing. On a sad note, I would like to acknowledge the passing of Chicago's civil rights icon and Roosevelt alum, Timuel Black, who passed away yesterday at the age of 102. Mr. Black dedicated his life to civil rights advocacy. He brought Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to Chicago in 1963 and later worked tirelessly to elect fellow Roosevelt alum, Harold Washington, as the first black mayor in the city of Chicago. I am grateful for his work and legacy. And my condolences go out to all whose lives he touched. Now let me turn to Dean Melissa Hogan to provide us with a COVID update. Dean Hogan. Thanks, Ali. We have a few changes and updates regarding COVID. First, as was announced last week, classes will resume following the Thanksgiving break. Everyone will be required to submit a negative COVID test after the break. You will have access to campus pending submission of your test. This applies to all students and employees who come to campus, regardless of whether or not you travel over the break. More details will follow, but you can plan to get this done at either the Schomburg or Chicago campus, or at the testing site of your choice. Second, we now accept only lab administered PCR tests. Although we had accepted the antigen test, we've seen too many false negatives and false positives with it. Third, we want to thank everyone for getting vaccinated. The simple fact that nearly everyone on campus is vaccinated made the recent increase in cases containable and completely survivable. Booster shots are recommended for individuals who received the Pfizer vaccine and soon the Moderna vaccine and are over 65 or are immunocompromised or in a high risk job. If you get a booster, you may upload it via the link on the app or the webpage. Fourth, 
we want to thank you for your ongoing honest use of the screening app and for wearing masks at all times on campus, except when eating in designated dining areas or when you are in your private office with your door closed. We know that it is inconvenient and can be challenging, particularly when lecturing or participating in performances or athletic activities. But we also know that masks limit transmission of COVID and support the safety of everyone on campus. Finally, I want to recognize that we are all tired of COVID. It has been over a year and a half, longer than anyone thought we would be facing this disease. Many of us have experienced personal losses of jobs and opportunities, of health and of loved ones. We are exhausted and it is frustrating to keep having to sacrifice to accommodate this disease. Please know that the members of the COVID committee are singularly focused on supporting everyone in our community. We have representation from every area of the university and our decisions are based on CDC and public health guidance. We appreciate your questions and input and we encourage you to continue to reach out. Together, we will keep working to keep our campus safe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hogan. My gratitude to you and everyone on the COVID committee for your good work and due diligence to keep our community safe. Now on academics and achievements, we had a robust and diverse pool of applicants for the provost search. The provost search committee has been working diligently to decide the candidates that will be interviewed via Zoom in a first round of interviews to be followed by a narrow selection of candidates to be invited to campus for final interviews. The search committee will provide updates throughout the search process and co-dean Kelly Wentz Hunter will share additional information at the University Senate in this regard tomorrow. Uh, so some news on student laureate, senior Rose Poblowski was selected as Roosevelt University's winner of the Abraham Lincoln Civic Engagement Award and named a student laureate of the Lincoln Academy of Illinois for the 2021-2022 year. Every year, each four-year university in Illinois nominates one outstanding senior whose curricular and extracurricular activities exemplify excellence and a, I quote, desire to make a difference in the world through civic engagement. Well, Rose was nominated because of her exceptional academic achievement in the honors program, the women's and gender studies major, and are you living and learning communities, and her ongoing civic participation advocating for community public health, reproductive rights, and gender justice. Congratulations, Rose. The teaching, the Equity Teaching Academy launched this spring with a new program that offers practical training for faculty on revising their syllabi, course materials and teaching practices as well. The planning process around this program was supported by a grant from the Chicago Community Trust and involved Roosevelt faculty members, current students, as well as faculty from Roosevelt Community College partners. The summer session included 22 participants, including the faculty members from all five RU colleges. Some of the topics covered were equity mindsets, accessible design, microaggressions, how to have difficult conversations and creating welcoming environments. Faculty teaching fellows who attended the academy used the learnings to structure and arrange their syllabi, creating more ways for the students to engage and feel like the classroom is a place for them. I would like to thank Professor Marjorie Jolis and Professor Mike Malley, who played a pivotal role in developing the academy and the summer instructors, including Professor Marjorie Jolis, Professor Ellen O'Brien, Professor Natasha Robinson, 
and Professor Susan Torres Hardy. Now a bit on grants. Roosevelt was awarded a five-year 2.7 million Title III federal grant to create new resources for Latinx and other low-income STEM students. This will allow us to build transfer pathways and extend career preparation skills for students in science, technology, and math. Through a partnership with the City Colleges of Chicago, Hispanic and Latinx students will have mentors before and after transferring to help navigate their transition. Roosevelt will also create a new STEM center on campus, serving as a hub for mentoring, tutoring, and professional development. With the support of this Title III grant, Roosevelt will connect students with career shadowing and internship opportunities at organizations such as Argonne National Laboratory, Northwestern Medicine, and the Shed Aquarium. So congratulations to Senior Vice Provost Mike Malley, Vice Provost Katrina Coakley, Dean Cammie McBride, Co-Dean Kelly Wants Hunter, and Dr. Deirdre Somerville for their good work to secure this grant, and then many others as well for their past successes. We also received a Better Chicago grant. The College of Education received a 1.6 million grant in September after receiving a $45,000 planning grant this summer through the Chicago Design Challenge sponsored by a Better Chicago. The new grants have launched a Metropolitan Chicago Tutoring Corps that will provide paid tutoring in reading and literacy to first through three grade. Uh, first through third grade students in select CPS schools over the next three years. 25 Roosevelt students and alumni are a part of the new tutoring core this year. The core will work uh, with approximately 15 schools this academic year that serve low income and historically marginalized students. The goal is to address COVID related learning losses and to prepare Chicago students for future academic success. Now, according to Dean Fillion, the tutoring, tutoring core will reach about 250 students this academic year. In three years, Roosevelt hopes to reach 1,200 students across Chicago. So my thanks to Dean Fillion, Professor Allison Slade, and Roosevelt Administrator, Jane Barnas, for their work on the grant proposal, Professor Lisa Quesada, who helped design the training program for the new tutors, and Professor Monique Herr, who supported the recruitment of the new tutors. Congratulations to all of you. A few words about the American Dream Reconsidered Conference. Every year I reflect on the origins of the annual conference unique to Roosevelt. And I'm thankful that we created a relevant and important forum that transcends times and generations. I'm proud we continue the important and conflicting conversations on what it means to be American. Because we all know, especially looking back just in these past 18 months, how important this question is for all of us. The conference scheduled to have an impressive lineup, lineup of speakers, discussions, and performances over the four day period. Please be sure to register for one or all of the sessions and encourage your students to attend as well. The panel discussions will feature many figures in politics, healthcare, academe, and law. The first panel discussion being held on November 1, titled The American Dream During a Time of Division, includes David Axelrod, who was a senior advisor to President Obama and is now a national political consultant and analyst. And also Bill Crystal, former chief of staff to Vice President Quayle and political commentator and editor at large of the Bulwark. 
the Women's Leadership Council is sponsoring a discussion entitled Women's Leadership and Gender Equity in Law and Medicine. Andy Harris, author and partner at McDermott, Will, and Emory LLP, and Dr. Neelam Agrawal, Associate Professor of Neurological Science at Rush Medical Center, will be leading that discussion. The panel on health and healthcare will feature Dr. Naguzi Ezike, Director of the State of Illinois Department of Public Health, and Dr. Carlos Del Rio, Professor of Medicine at Emory University. The conference will conclude with a very special premiere performance of Immigrant Mass with composer Carlos Yaquez Gonzalez and conductor Dr. Cheryl Frazes Hill and led by the CCPA Conservatory Choir. To take a deeper dive into each of the conference panels and discussions, I encourage you to download the university podcast and Justice for All, which can be found on our website and on most streaming platforms. A very special thank you to conference faculty co-chairs, Professor Stuart Warner and Professor Andrew Trees for their time, passion, and enthusiasm to plan a full schedule of events, along with committee members, Dr. Michael Ford, Katora Brown, Kathy Bliss, Maya Kaluzny, Amanda De Palma, Jared Fritz McCarthy, Dr. Ralph Martiri, and Nicole Barrett. Now to the Auditorium Theater. There's a lot of good news from the Auditorium Theater that I would like to mention, including that we have a full schedule running this fall. And I encourage you to attend one of the many live performances. The full schedule will be found, will be found on the website auditoriumtheater.org. The theater has many new capital projects on the way, including painting of the gallery, upgraded Wi-Fi and sound systems, and new sound signage throughout the theater. A special thank you to the leadership of the Auditorium Theater, Rich Regan, Rachel Freund, Colleen Flanagan, and Jolie Green for their amazing work to keep the theater alive and alive during the pandemic by delivering shows, content, and tours throughout the year, as well as virtually. I hope you're as excited as I am to enjoy live theater once again. Now, a bit about the future and some concluding remarks. So I would like to conclude with some thoughts around the future. It has been an eye-opening past year and a half, as Dean Hogan mentioned. And time has magnified our inequalities, abuse, disparities, hate, division, and gaps across all industries and higher education as well. However, I am grateful for Roosevelt's legacy and our mission. Our people and culture continue to evolve and will remain committed to preparing future socially conscious students and leaders for communities around the world. Higher education is a unique environment. Unlike most industries, higher ed is resilient, yet vulnerable, flexible, yet restrictive, all at the same time, and holds an unlimited number of opportunities for both the faculty and staff who work here and for students who take advantage of earning a degree. And for mid-sized schools like Roosevelt, we might ask, how do we compete? Well, we can and we do. In addition to the common attributes of our size, like smaller classes, personal attention that you all give to our students. Um, Roosevelt has the advantage of being able to focus and provide access to often overlooked populations who may not have financial means, maybe immigrants, and maybe an adult working at the same time while wanting to seek a degree 
maybe a single parent or a student struggling with disabilities or all of the above. We invest in programs to serve a wide range of populations and strive to deliver them with options and choices to meet our students' needs. To close, I would like to remind you about the upcoming employee recognition ceremony on Tuesday, October 19th at 3 p.m. in Gons Hall. This marks an important day for our faculty and staff as we recognize their long-term meaningful contributions to the Roosevelt University. I hope everyone can attend or join us via live stream. Now I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, Michael. Actually, there are no questions at this time. All right. Well, then we, can, we have to wait here for another hour. Just one popped in. Uh, can you speak to the Georgia Board of Regents move yesterday? Uh, what I recall was uh, that if you remind me if that's uh, related to uh, to softening the uh, tenure at Georgia system, is that the one they're referring to? Demanding post tenure, yes. Right, demanding post tenure. Uh, this has a this is new for Georgia, but it has been happening in many places across the country. Uh, it happened in Arizona 20 some years ago when I was there and other places as well. Uh, it is rather fashionable to do post tenure review of faculty members. Identify some as quote unquote unproductive and then basically uh, uh, cancel their tenure and ask them to leave the university. What typically happens is in some cases, those faculty members who get a bad review on post tenure are put on a development plan and then for two years or three years and then their tenure is negated. Um, I haven't seen a good model yet. I'm not very familiar with what happened in uh, Georgia, but we have no plans to do such a thing at Rosa. When will the new tuition rates be published on the website? Okay, it should be out pretty soon. Uh, maybe. Uh, 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 Mike Cassidy can answer that specifically, but we will publish them because the students will be uh, for the following academic year, the students need to know exactly what it is. So Mike, do you know exactly when it will be up? We have not determined the official publication date um, as of yet. Last year, actually, we did not publish the, the rates to the website till later on in the academic year. Um, but the rates can be shared with prospective students um, as uh, you know, our admissions teams um, have discussions with prospective students for um, fall 22, but we'll be making those assessments and getting that, that information posted shortly. Okay, thank you. Very unclear about the testing and return to campus after Thanksgiving break. Um, Melissa, do you wanna add any clarification to that? Sure. So we're asking everyone to get tested between the Friday after Thanksgiving, so November 26th until December 6th, any time in that time frame, and submit your test either um, if you're a student to the Dean of Students and if you're an employee to HR via the app or the link on the website. You can access campus during that time, um, but we are just trying to, um, because we know people will be visiting others, will be participating in other activities and maybe traveling, we want to get um, sort of a baseline as we come back. 
to monitor the safety of the community, the health and safety of the community. Thanks, Willis. How will the university promote the use of media uh, for the American Dream Conference outside of the university? Uh, Nicole? Yeah, absolutely. Um, primarily through our website, and we do have some limited media running on radio, uh, social media, both our channels and paid social media, um, as well as email through our internal list of past registrants and then uh, through purchase lists as well. Okay. And I should add that the conference is resonating extremely well in the community. I've been hearing from my colleagues and somebody I just met recently a new president uh, in Chicago and immediately he mentioned the conference and what a great thing it was for Roosevelt and for the community because it's open to the public. How can RU assure that we protect tenure? Uh, hold on, this just moved. Including hiring new faculty through tenure lines. Okay. Uh, Again, this has, this has significant implications before anything happens on tenure or to tenure. Uh, first of all, I won't be here at that time. So it's way, way after I leave the university. And I plan to leave the university probably 30 years from now, joking. Uh, there are no plans at all to discuss the dilution of tenure, uh, weakening of tenure, touching tenure, or anything else. Throughout this process, and even when we have had budget issues, every faculty member who was eligible for tenure and who received positive evaluation from his or her colleagues was successful in the tenure process. The trustees have shown um, no inclination to even start a discussion in that regard. So I can give you my assurances in that regard and faculty trustees who are also present at all the uh, uh, board of trustees meetings can attest as well as Senate president that we haven't had any discussion in this regard at all. It was mentioned the budget will be balanced thanks to COVID relief funds Will the budget be in peril again once COVID relief funds are no longer available? Well, we, we hope not. Uh, you know, everything depends on enrollment. If enrollment picks up for spring semester and summer semester and prospects look good for next year, especially returning students be retained and graduate students and transfer students uh, coming back, I think we have a very good chance going forward to have a balanced budget. Every year I say this, it all depends on enrollment. Uh, now, the federal government provided us with relief funds, uh, three batches of CARES Act money, and we have used it specifically for that purpose, mainly because they knew, the federal government knew, and we all lobbied that uh, COVID affects enrollment. So we applied it to enrollment and to the cost of uh, that the university had for uh, students making sure they have enough funds so that they can come back, as well as the cost, the additional cost that we have. So yes, we are applying uh, approximately $8 million of the remaining COVID money to this year's budget. And we will watch the budget like a hog. Uh, and we want to have a balanced budget for this year and going forward. OK, we have a series of uh, COVID-related questions. And the first one is, is will there be another required negative test before the start of winter 2022 term? Um, I can answer that. So we just started discussing that this week, and we'll let folks know as soon as we have a decision. And given the desire to monitor COVID internally after Thanksgiving break, will that affect the visitor policy and or limit visitor access to campus? Will they need to provide a negative test in addition to their proof of vaccination? That's a good question. I'll take that back to the committee. 
And last but not least, will the university provide PRC tests to employees between 1126 and 126? If so, how can testing be scheduled? So the testing that takes place on campus are PCR tests. So folks can access that on Mondays and Thursdays uh, at the Chicago campus or the Schomburg campus. And information about accessing those tests is on the website. And you know, uh, Michael, let me also mention this and uh, to the committee. Uh, really, once again, my thanks goes to the committee for staying one step ahead of COVID. These are tough regulations. Yes, they are. Uh, as you know, based on their recommendation, we required vaccination long before everybody else was even thinking about it. And we are hearing across the country that some universities are not requiring it for political reasons, not for health reasons, for political reasons. We just cannot allow that to happen. So everything that we say regarding mask, vaccination, testing is for health reasons and uh, not political reasons. So thank you again to Melissa, to Michael, and to the entire team. We'll be able to do new hires as tenure lines rather than visiting or other non tenure track positions. Uh, we will be hiring tenure track faculty. It's been ongoing. Now it's uh, not as many as perhaps previously, but again, it's a budget issue that we have to watch. Uh, so selectively, especially based on supporting the accreditation uh, in the professional programs, we, yes, replace tenure track faculty, but otherwise we will uh, work with the deans and department chairs and the provost and support hiring on the NTT basis until our budget situation becomes less tenuous. Has the university considered doing any communications to the broader community about the Department of Education's recent update to the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program, particularly graduates in our own internal community, staff and faculty, who might likely be eligible? Uh, all right, it, it's a good discussion, and I think uh, we need to think about how to do that. So that's a good suggestion. So if uh, Nicole, uh, Michelle Stepp, Stepp and uh, Mike Cassidy and us to visit later on so that we can publicize that better. That would be a good idea to do. And I think we might have gone through all of the questions thus far. We do have a few more minutes if there's any Final thoughts. I should also mention, Michael, that uh, we do have a significant amount of scholarships available for the students and COVID money available to the students. Those emails are going out and returning students will be receiving significant amount of support. And this is again, COVID dollars that is specifically designated for students to use for their education purposes. And that will be going out uh, this week or early next week. So the students know before they register for spring semester. I ask that if you do have questions, please submit them in the Q&A versus the chat.
The additional COVID funds for students that Ali just referred to, could they be used for summer? Uh, the patches, the monies could be used for summer, but uh, first we have to get through uh, the spring semester. Uh, and depending on how much of the money is remaining, then it will be allocated for the summer is my understanding. Uh, Mike Cassidy, you wanna be more specific on that? Yeah, a couple points. The uh, communications, the fall 21, um, allocation of CARES and higher education emergency relief funds for students um, went out at uh, 3.30. So most all students should have received their link to the application. Um, so um, I invite all students to complete that ac application um, to uh, receive those emergency relief funds if needed. Um, those funds go directly to the student. They do have the option of choosing to use those um, towards their balance, or they can choose to receive those directly um, in terms of a direct fund um, to the student. Um, the student has to designate their choice of receipt of funds in that regard. Um, and so they are in no way tied to future registration or um, to their existing account balance. A student though can utilize those funds um, for an existing account balance or just hold on to those funds in their bank account to use towards future funds if they do not have an existing balance. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Again, if you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A, not the chat. Also, new questions coming in. Given the volume of testing, can we offer more times and days in the week following Thanksgiving for on-campus testing? And I'll say Jamar. Sorry, could you repeat the question? Given the volume of testing, can we offer more times and days in the week following Thanksgiving for on-campus testing? Great question. Um, so the testing dates and times are already set with our vendor, but we'll certainly reach out. Um, to discuss an increase um, in those, um, but we are able to accommodate up to 400 people um, during each testing clinic. So I believe that the current capacity should be sufficient, but we'll certainly look at additional uh, dates to be added. Yeah. All right. As tuition has increased, will housing also increase for fall 22? When will those costs be announced? Uh, the cost of housing is not uh, increasing for the next fiscal year at this time. How do you plan to process all of the students, faculty, and administrative personnel in the period after Thanksgiving? And what, and what if you only get 80% completion? I'll, I'll just keep my camera on. Uh, so uh, we are actively working with the uh, IT team now. Uh, to develop a new system for receiving the test uh, results. Um, I look forward to sharing uh, with the community an update regarding that relatively soon, but we will have a plan uh, to follow up on that. Um, look, luckily, um, prior to the time that the test will be received. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Omar. It looks like we don't have any other questions at the moment. And Ali has advised me he's not afraid of silence. So if there's a moment that you need to put a question in the Q&A box, certainly submit that. If you choose to put a question in the Q&A, uh, someone else is managing that. And we'll address those questions as well. Uh, but if you want Ali to respond, please use the Q&A. And you know, also a reminder that tomorrow at the Senate, of course, I will be answering questions and follow up questions from our colleagues as well.
as a follow-up, is this the only testing that will be accepted uh, is the testing at RU? And that's no, you can get a test at any site that you choose. We do have some that are published on the webpage and you can also come to Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Okay, if there are no more questions, as Ali said, we will uh, have an opportunity to address more concerns tomorrow at University Senate. And we look forward to seeing everyone there. And thank you for your time today. Ali, any final thoughts? Yeah, I wanna thank everyone for attending this year's town hall. I hope you, your families, friends, loved ones are staying safe and healthy, especially as we're all looking forward and making plans for the holidays this year. Thank you again for your sacrifices, your hard work, and your contributions to Roosevelt University. Have a wonderful day. Thanks and have a great day, everybody.